that. And, uh, I, I, I got a chart. I'll, I, I lie. I lie about it better than you do, anyway. So. How many people do we have on at this time? Uh, right now, sixty. That's pretty good. All right. I just start or you know. Dan, go ahead. Okay. Well, hi everybody. All 60 of you and hopefully growing as the morning wears on. Everybody has to get their coffee and put some pants on. Actually, you don't have to put pants on, but, but I did. Uh, anyway, uh, I was asked, uh, oh, I don't know, a month ago to, uh, to do this kickoff talk. And uh, it's kind of an exciting topic. And uh, I spend much of my career doing airplane stuff, but I also do space stuff. And I, I really love it. So it was very nice to, uh, to uh, be invited to do this thing. So uh, I'll uh, kind of just jump right into it. Uh, the, the topic is technologies to live on other planets. Uh, and I decided to focus on uh, two aspects, uh, getting to the other planet and then getting around on the other planet. Uh, I'm not the one to talk about how we're going to have life support on Mars and how we're going to mine Venus and do all those other things that, that sounded so exciting in the science fiction story that I read as a kid. So I'll let other people do that. Uh, I'm just going to focus on getting there and getting around. And uh, hope it can be both entertaining and informative. Uh, let me say, and forgive me, but uh, let me make sure everybody realizes that I'm, I'm showing some concepts, but I'm, I'm not giving up my ownership rights. I'm not throwing these out to the world to do with as you will. Uh, and especially the, the radiant rocket and the Mars plane concept that I'll show. I'm going to keep ownership and copyright to these slides and everything else associated with that. We'll try to arrange so we can uh, get these up on the AIAA website, but I'll have to get AIAA to acknowledge that I still own the copyright and they're allowed to show it. So I'm pretty sure we can work that out. Okay, so anyway, let me press on then. Uh, my biography and, and kind of a younger picture of me, I, I don't look too far away from that, I think, but maybe I'm fooling myself. Uh, I noticed the flip phone though. I really missed my flip phone, so that was a while ago. Uh, anyway, I've been involved in aircraft and spacecraft design for uh, rather a long time. Uh, I am an AIAA fellow, very proud of that. I joined the IAA in college, stayed active through the decades, and I strongly recommend it. Uh, get on a national technical committee if you can at all. Uh, also get involved in one of the other committees. I actually, actually spent quite a long time on the publications committee, of all things, uh, and found it very rewarding, and I feel like I was able to help the IAA also. Uh, I uh, have mostly done aircraft design through my career, aircraft and spacecraft. And I am one of those blank sheet of paper configuration guys that's what I actually do. That's my main technical skill set. Uh, but I've got involved in a lot of other things along the way. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, uh, I'll skip some of that stuff. Yes, I went to college. Uh, and I put a, a slide together showing some of the specific stuff I've done on spacecraft. And one of the best things was that I started out and learned aircraft design at the old North American Aviation Company which did a lot of the early spacecraft stuff. So my first boss designed the X-15, uh, and in the little room with me, uh, the guy that designed the B-70, uh, main designer of the space shuttle, uh, and a whole lot of other uh, uh, projects, F-108, and a bunch of things like that. So I actually learned it from guys who did a lot of the early stuff. I did wind up, uh, after 10 years at, uh, at North American Rockwell, I did go to Aerojet, and uh, started the directorate there for future missions. So it was a vehicle studies group at the Aerojet Propulsion Research Institute. And then after that, I became director of advanced design at Lockheed. Most of what I did was airplane stuff, but there was one uh, IR&D project uh, that I was over uh, that was a whole lot like HyperX. It was a hypersonic uh, scramjet research project that Lockheed was proposing that would get launched from an SR-71. Uh, and it, it never been anywhere, most of these things don't, but uh, did a lot of stuff on that. I also spent five years uh, supporting the Air Force uh, uh, in their future access to space technologies project. I was their quote unquote lead designer on that effort. And I, that's one of the things I'm gonna show today. And then I've done a lot of stuff in the, in the private world, uh, supporting various companies. They, they call me and they hire me and I do conceptual design and do preliminary analysis and I work with them and, and all that kind of stuff. So I did the Black Horse. Uh, uh, that's one of those early uh, projects that has actually some, some internet street cred. Uh, people think it's cool. Uh, I designed the vehicle for Pioneer Rocket Plane. Uh, and there's two others, and I, I can't talk about them. Uh, one of them is, is very quiet. Uh, the other you know about, but I'm not allowed to say I did it for them. But that's, that's how NDAs go, and 
Uh, they have they have orders. So uh, anyway, uh, and I teach aircraft design and also spacecraft and launch vehicle design short courses. So uh, yeah, I wrote some books. Most people know me from the book conceptual uh, approach. Uh, I also wrote the software and the projects I'm going to show you here. I designed on my RDS software. And I teach these short courses and just a quick quick add. I did have to delay the aircraft design short course that was supposed to start this coming Monday here in Los Angeles. That was poorly timed. So it's rescheduled for towards the end of August. I figure that way the first panic will be over and the second panic won't have started yet. So there are still some seats in that class. Okay, well anyway, I wanna talk about three things, two of them getting there and the third getting around. So I'll just jump into it. So if you wanna talk about uh, living on other planets, and we always talk about Mars, that's the obvious one, uh, you have to get there, uh, and you have to get a lot of stuff there. And it's kind of a strange thing, and many of you are in the, the, the spacecraft and launch vehicle design community, so you know this stuff better than I do, but for people who aren't aware of this, uh, it, it seems like the hard part is getting to Mars, and, and it is, but just getting from our ground up into Earth orbit is almost as hard. It's just 250 miles straight up. Uh, if it wasn't straight up, you could drive it in about three and a half, four hours, uh, but it's straight up. But that doesn't seem like that's so difficult, whereas it's, it's about 250 million miles, uh, depending on when, uh, to get actually to Mars. So that would seem like the hard part. But if you do the math, uh, and you rocket scientists do the math, uh, delta V is the calculation that tells you how much energy you have to add. And depending on how you assume and how you do it, but it's something like 40,000 feet per second, you need to provide energy for that much acceleration just to get up into Earth orbit. And then it's 66,000 more to go to Mars. So if you want to live on Mars, you better really focus on getting up off the Earth. That's a hard thing. So that first step is actually about the toughest thing, or at least one of them. So I'm going to show two uh, to try to take care of that first step. Uh, and uh, uh, if we want to go to Mars and survive there, we need a lot of stuff into orbit. So it either has to be reusable, and the first one I'll talk about is focused on reusable, or absolutely dirt cheap. I mean, throw away dirt cheap. I mean, you know, buy the cheap car instead of the expensive car, dirt cheap. Uh, or magic, and I won't talk about magic this time. Uh, so anyway, the first one then is talking about reusability. This is a study that I did for the Air Force, and it was actually over about a five-year period of time. Uh, it went through a bunch of different names. It started out as Micro X, a little vehicle shown there. Uh, and the whole idea was to build a demonstrator uh, quickly and cheaply. Uh, if we would followed the schedule that we were working towards, it would have already flown by now and it would be in a museum somewhere. And unfortunately, the Air Force never funded it in this incarnation. Uh, they wound up funding something a little different, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but that's the idea, to look at uh, highly reusable vehicles. Uh, so you're going to have to re-enter after uh, boost. Uh, it's got to be pretty affordable to build it. You have to do a quick turnaround. You can't afford to, to strip and redo all the rocket engines every single time. Uh, you want something more like a UAV. Uh, so that's what we were looking at and looking at a bunch of technologies. And uh, I got to do the fun stuff, which is vehicle designs. I did about 20 or 30 different vehicle designs over a five-year period. Uh, now, this is the kind of vehicle that ultimately we were looking for, which is a reusable single stage to orbit vehicle. That's what everybody wants. That's really tough. Uh, you need a propellant mass fraction of something like 96% or more. So when it's sitting on the ground ready to launch, 96% or more has to be your propellant. Uh, and what's left is the structure, the wings, the tails, the thermal protection system, the control, all the payload handling, everything else, it's really tough to do. You can make it a little bit easier uh, if you start by dropping it from another airplane. You can make it a little bit easier if you do it like Robert Heinlein uh, and have some kind of a sled that runs up Pikes Peak and throws it in, in the air off the top of Pikes Peak. And there's various other schemes you can do to make it a little easier. But it's still a very high propellant mass fraction, something close to 96% even with those uh, things. So this is very tough. So that's what we were looking at. The Air Force has a great interest in this, and they were hoping we would find a, a magic bullet somewhere, a flying unicorn that would make all this work. So I started out with this design, a very simple design, very small, 18 feet, that would literally fit in my office here. Uh, and uh, just, uh, uh, just enough capability to demonstrate uh, things that would get up to a little over 100,000 feet, and I forget the number, Mach 6 or something like that. Uh, 
but it would demonstrate a lot of the technologies. Now, the first concept was looking at a vertical lander. Uh, and for a vertical lander, you have a problem. You have to somehow get the rockets pointing down when you're landing. So you probably re-enter with the nose forward, but you have to flip it around somehow. So uh, I thought I invented something. Here's what I thought I invented. You glide down and you pop a little parachute at the nose. It swings around, the propellant stabilizes, and you get it all in a nice stabilized descent, and then you cut away the parachute and land. I, I thought that was a great invention. Uh, and I took it up uh, and showed it to Bert Rutan up at Scaled Composites. And he said, yeah, that's what he thinks too. He'd been looking at that for years. So, oops, I wasn't the first. But uh, anyway, it is one of the ways of doing it. Uh, another way of doing it uh, is some kind of an aerodynamic surface in front, some kind of a canard or the uh, waffle grids that are sometimes used uh, uh, on missiles, uh, grid fins. Uh, and that would work also. And of course, that's what Elon Musk uses. It's got some uh, pluses and minuses. One of the great pluses is that it actually allows you to steer your vehicle uh, while it is pointing backwards, whereas with the chute, you're just sort of hanging from the chute and put it like the fire. Anyway, so different concepts to look at for vertical land. Uh, we also looked at a horizontal lander, so I took my basic design and stuck a wing and some tails on it and uh, did a whole bunch of analysis trying to find out which was better. And if you look at the bottom there, uh, yeah, look at the laser. If you look at the bottom there, well, uh, the empty weight uh, is increased by about 444 pounds for this size vehicle. And you don't have to have landing propellant, which saves about 465 pounds. So it's kind of a wash. And I did a lot more studies later, and every time I studied it, uh, difference between a horizontal and a vertical lander. It was about the same. So you can kind of pick it by other considerations, I think. Not completely sure, but I think that's the case. Okay, and then of course that was just a little tiny demonstrator. We were also looking at big vehicles that could do something useful. So this one had a 95,000 pound payload. Uh, it did not go to orbit. You'll notice there's a big blob on the top. Looks, looks like a big water heater. It is a missile that uh, uh, would carry the payload the rest of the way into orbit. So that other part is not reusable. Uh, it's basically some tanks and a rocket motor. Since it's carried on the outside here, it has to be streamlined and it has to have a nice aero shell around it. The other option is to make the main vehicle a lot bigger and carry it on the inside. Uh, and I've done design studies both ways. And I'm still not exactly sure which way is the best way to go. Uh, again, when you get the final numbers, it's kind of close. So uh, more study is needed. Uh, one of the things that looked interesting was a BIMES launch, where you have two of them strapped together. Uh, you can do it belly to belly or back to back or, or belly to back. You, you can look at the different options. Uh, but that's kind of a neat thing. If you build two nearly identical vehicles, it's relatively cheaper because of the learning curve effect. Uh, it's not quite as optimum if you had a separate first stage, uh, but you might have a cost saving. So we looked at this one. Not sure if this is the best way to go, uh, but it is an interesting option. Now this one still had a throwaway on the top. We got this guy here that is not reusable. Uh, and so we also took a look at a concept where you had an upper stage that was reusable. So this is a reusable upper stage. Uh, not trying to go single stage to orbit, that's really tough to do. So this would be a smaller reusable vehicle, uh, potentially launched uh, on a larger version that looks similar, which is what the space shuttle was supposed to do. Or you could launch it on a throwaway first stage uh, or a first stage that looks like a throwaway, but actually flies back the way you know, it does, which works pretty well. So anyway, this was a reusable upper stage. You'll notice there's a pretty good size payload bay in here, so you don't have to protect and shield the payload itself. Uh, and uh, relatively small propellant tanks because you're not taken off from the ground, you're just giving it that final kick to orbit speed. So this was also looked at quite a bit. Uh, notice that I did two different designs, one with tip fins and one with vertical tails on the fuselage. And this is another one of those things. I went through lots and lots of study and finally concluded, you know, there's not that big of a difference between them, depending on the assumptions you make. Uh, there's pros and cons, uh, a lot of good aerodynamic reasons for going with tip fins, but the structure looks a little more difficult. And uh, anyway, it's, it's one of those things that you kind of have to do your own trade study. It probably depends on exactly what you're doing and what technologies you have. Uh, one thing that definitely plays in is if you're using uh, complete usage of composite materials, a lot of the weight penalty of tip fins is significantly reduced. So, Okay, then the final phase of this five-year project, it morphed and morphed and the name kept changing. And the last one was Future Responsive Access to Space Technologies. And they say FAST, but when I look at it, it should be FRAST, but that sounds stupid. 
So anyway, FAST was the project, uh, and this was sort of in the uh, uh, early, uh, or 2007 to 2009 timeframe. And what they actually did is they uh, gave uh, large contracts to three major companies shown there. Uh, and my role was basically to come up with the design you see here, which was called the reference flight system. It was sort of the government's final version of what this thing ought to look like. Uh, and the contractors were supposed to use it as their point of departure for their studies. And I say supposedly there because you know what they did, uh, and I would do the same thing. They all had their own design studies. They were working on this already. So they took a look at my design, and they made a view graph that said, yeah, we looked at that design, and here's our design, which was derived from it. And of course it wasn't, but that's okay. You know, I'd have done the same. Anyway, uh, this uh, did not fly. It was a ground experiment, including uh, the airframe. They built a pretty substantial airframe structure when they did that. Um, it sort of led to the DARPA XS-1 program, which was supposed to fly, but didn't fly. Uh, and I don't know if the Air Force is doing anything right now on it, whether they're continuing to pursue some of the technologies that were developed and tested on the ground. Okay, well, that's the end of that story. And uh, you know, this is weird because I'm not hearing anything from the audience. So I assume you're all cheering and applauding and, and asking real relevant questions, which I can't hear. Great job so far. If there's questions, we'll do it at the end. Uh, anyway, okay. So, Dan, the audience has kept mute during the entire presentation. They will ask questions at the end of the presentation. Perfect. Can't you unmute them just long enough for the wild applause? I'm kidding. Okay, okay. Anyway, all right. So that's that's. Uh, the, I call it wild, you know, it's pretty difficult to do what we were trying to do in that Air Force project. But it's a bunch of technologies and you can put them together and they get better year after year. And yeah, something like that's gonna work eventually. And then the question is, is it better than the other ways of doing it? So, uh, you know, that's, that, that's not so crazy. Uh, second one, we're getting a little crazier. Uh, and this is an idea that I actually came up with when I was at Aerojet and we were gonna patent it for Aerojet but Aerojet decided to close the Propulsion Research Institute for financial reasons. Uh, and so they never patented it in my name. And I had the option of patenting it myself. I, I never did. So I'm not really sure if I, if I should, maybe it's too late, but in any case, I'll show it to you. It's kind of fun. Here's the basic idea. This is from the invention disclosure drawing that I sent to the Aerojet patent folks. And if you look at it, you probably figure it out already. And it's like, oh no, that's crazy. Wait, maybe it's not crazy. The idea looks a lot like this. You build one of these mirror farms like we use for solar energy. There's several of them. There's a big one out in the desert, not that far from LA. Uh, and the only difference is you make those mirrors fast. Uh, currently, they just have to be fast enough to track the sun as it goes across the sky. Now we're gonna make them fast enough that they can bounce the reflected, reflected energy of the sun onto the bottom of a launch vehicle. You got it? I mean, it's a simple idea. I'm amazed it wasn't thought of before. Maybe it was. Maybe somebody came up with that back in the 1930s. Who knows? But I never saw it. Uh, Rudy Beichel never saw it. Uh, he was one of the Pinamundi guys. Uh, he was still consulting at Aerojet at the time, and he, he said it was the best idea he'd seen in years. So who knows? Maybe it would work. Anyway, that's the basic idea. So you get a launch vehicle that looks something like this, and I'm not sure of the details. Obviously, uh, a whole bunch of development work wasn't done because Aerojet decided to stop doing stuff like this. But the basic idea is you have some kind of a heat target and that heats up the propellant and basically the heat of the sun uh, replaces the chemical energy that you normally would burn in a rocket fuel. So you wind up with a very, very simple launch vehicle, presumably. They're always simple before you do the detailed design, but at least it looks simple so far. Uh, and uh, the numbers look pretty good. Uh, we had some pretty smart people uh, at the Aerojet Propulsion Research Institute, PhDs and all sorts of stuff. And uh, they took a good look at it and uh, you get some impressive ISPs and you get numbers very similar to nuclear rockets. You're heating up uh, the working fluid, not with the energy in the working fluid, you're heating it up from an external source. In this case, you're just directly bouncing the energy from the sun. If you use liquid hydrogen, you get ISPs of 900 which is really good. That's almost three times what you get out of a good LOX hydrogen uh, rocket motor. Uh, that's a really good number. Uh, or you can just use water. You can literally make it a steam rocket, literally just have a tank full of water and heat it up. And if you can get that energy into the water, you can get an ISP comparable to what you get out of the space shuttle main engine. 
which is not really surprising if you think about it, because that's what comes out of the space shuttle main engine. Uh, it is hot water, it's hot steam. So in any case, uh, at least at the top level, it makes sense. The hard part is getting that energy into the working fluid. So uh, presumably you would seed the propellant with some kind of carbon black or something uh, and expose it through uh, uh, some quartz windows or something, uh, or maybe, uh, uh, maybe you heat up the tank itself uh, or something else, I'm not really sure. So we looked at this in some detail, but not the level of detail design. And it would sure be great to get a funded study to look at this. Uh, what about the actual mirrors themselves? And we got some physics types to, uh, to take a look at this. Uh, the first thing that you have to realize and think about is that the distance isn't the distance from the mirror to the vehicle. It's the distance from the sun to the vehicle bounced from a mirror. If, if the mirror is optically flat, and we can build them that way. That's no brainer. That's existing technology. We do it for, for telescopes all the time. If we can build it optically flat, uh, then there's virtually no difference. There's no uh, typical expansion as if it was a light source on the ground. So it, it comes out pretty much parallel rays. So that part is good. There's an edge diffraction problem, um, but I had a uh, PhD physicist take a look at that and says it's okay for about a thousand miles. Um, and I, I, I think that's probably the right answer. Thermal blooming, some other things need a lot more study. Um, but one of the nice things is that uh, it's not concentrated in one location until you get pretty close to the vehicle because these mirrors are spread across quite a, quite a wide area. So how wide of an area? Uh, last calculation done at Aerojet was to figure out how many mirrors you would need uh, based on uh, typical uh, efficiencies uh, of uh, either silver coated or just a sapphire mirror, which is actually pretty cheap. Uh, taking into account the losses through the atmosphere, and taking into account a reasonable pointing accuracy, which certainly seems like we could do that. Uh, we, we were almost there already in 86. Uh, so it looks like about 53 uh, uh, kilometers square or about five by five miles. So uh, the picture shows five by five miles overlaid on Edwards Air Force Base. And that's a pretty big area, but it's not, not crazy big. It's not impossible. We do stuff that big. That's sort of human large-scale engineering, you, you hire somebody like Bechtel and, and they do it. So it could be done. Calculations of cost sounds like something like $10 billion today. Uh, and uh, who knows, uh, maybe that would be a cool thing. Uh, if you back up to this, by the way, uh, if the launch vehicles are so simple and cheap, uh, you could launch them all day long. You know, the, the heck with this, you know, a launch every week, you know, launch, launch one every couple hours. Just lift another one up there, fill it full of water from your garden hose, and, and off you go. Uh, and there's a whole lot of time between launches uh, where that mirror uh, field, the mirror farm, is just sitting there. So we could use it. We could generate electricity for, uh, for use, for public use, uh, when we're not launching. And we're only launching for a few minutes at a time. So the expense isn't totally wasted on this. You could actually use it uh, rather well. Uh, you could also uh, use it for desalinization, and perhaps you could build a city around this. You've got this thing providing electricity, uh, heat, uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, clean water. Uh, but you know, that might be pretty neat. So if you were going to do this, sort of build your star city, uh, but for real, where would you build it? Well, here's the locations that ought to make sense. You want it kind of near the equator, so you can take advantage of Earth's rotation for launch. You want it somewhere nice and sunny, and you want it somewhere with the uh, open ocean facing to the east, because we always launch to the east. So here's the good spots, and I hate to say it, but the best place in the world, as near as I can tell, is the southern Somalia coast in Africa. It's got the sun, it's got the, the ocean right there, it's open to the east, it's right on the equator. Uh, the only problem is, of course, it's a, uh, it's a tyrannical government infested with pirates. But other than that, it's a great place to do it. Okay, so that's my second one. And uh, looks like I'm keeping to my time. So the third one, uh, and it's a Mars airplane. And Mars airplanes have been done before. Uh, an old idea actually going back to 1978 really and maybe before then. So here's a concept uh, where a Mars airplane would re-enter in an aero shell and would hang under a parachute and the thing would unfold as it's descending under the parachute and hopefully before it hits the ground it, it's completed everything checks out and it flies away 
So that was looked at pretty seriously. They were actually gonna build one and send it to Mars. Uh, it should have happened 20 years ago. I don't know why it got canceled. It was probably money, politics, that kind of stuff. Uh, but that was the idea. But this is just for exploring Mars and it didn't have an ability to land and fly anywhere else. Uh, I actually got involved in a Mars airplane. I was on the faculty at Cal State Northridge uh, for three years, right after I left Lockheed. Uh, and my students as a senior design project designed and built an airplane designed to fly on Mars, uh, which means uh, it can fly in the very thin air. Uh, and uh, they did a great job and uh, they never got to fly it up at high altitude to demonstrate it, but they flew it at low altitude, it flew very well. Uh, the whole thing weighed 35 pounds. And it's got the wingspan of a typical general aviation airplane. It's the same wingspan of the airplane I fly whenever I get a chance. And yet you could pick this thing up and hold it in one hand if you're a little on the strong side and somebody balances the wings. So that's the kind of structure you need to fly on Mars. So a little bit of involvement there. Uh, then I got involved again about 10 years ago, Jim French, who wrote or co-authored the AIAA uh, uh, spacecraft design book, uh, contacted me and he wanted my help on a proposal he was putting together for a Mars airplane. And I said, sure, Jim, it sounds like fun. So uh, I threw together a couple of designs. Uh, his main uh, approach for that was to use a rocket that used carbon dioxide and oxygen locks. Uh, and that's uh, not the greatest combination of propellants, but it works and it's easy to build a rocket that works with that. They've done it, it's been tested already and the ISPs aren't terrible. Um, but what's nice about it is you can get that stuff for free out of the Martian atmosphere. Uh, you can cook it out of the atmosphere. There's a, a electrolysis process that takes a lot of energy uh, temperature and pressure, if I remember correctly, but you can do that. You can cook it out of the Martian atmosphere. So that's the idea here. So uh, Jim defined a, uh, uh, both a rocket engine for takeoff and landing uh, and uh, a, uh, a carbon, uh, carbon monoxide oxygen uh, uh, motor. Uh, and I forget, I can't remember if it was internal combustion or something else, but I think it was a sterling cycle. Of sort. Anyway, so he defined that and I wrapped an airplane around it. Uh, the one at the top here, the first one I did was a very kind of a normal looking airplane. And I decided to be a little crazier on the next one. And I was really thinking about, well, what if you wanted to land this thing and take off again? That, that was the whole idea of this. It, 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 it uh, is assembled on the ground uh, and then it takes off uh, vertically with the, with the rockets. So I thought, well, you need a lot of ground clearance. So I started playing with a configuration that looks like this. The wing is up high on struts and the fuselage is down low near the ground. And I thought that potentially would give you better ground clearance, plus the fact that it looks like the uh, Starship Enterprise, which is gonna be a plus. So anyway, so that was a design I did uh, quite a while ago for, uh, for Jim. And we put in a proposal and didn't win, you know, it usually happens. Okay, well anyway, so when Ken contacted me to give this talk, I was originally just gonna show some of this old stuff. And then I thought, you know, that's old stuff. Why don't I do a new design? So uh, I decided a week ago to do a new design. I've been kicking it around, making sketches and playing with it for 10 years. So I had a pretty good idea where I wanted to go with that. So I decided to put together a new design and do some real calculations. So you're seeing this for the first time. Uh, and unless somebody finds something terribly wrong with what I did, I'll probably put this into an AIAA paper and maybe put in a proposal somewhere. And if anybody has any ideas, I'd be fascinated to talk about funding it. Um, but in any case, let me show you what I, uh, what I did. Uh, Dan, yeah. just be a cautious. This uh, conference is attended by a lot of people, including some from overseas. So oh. I don't know. Uh, I'll let you decide how, how oh. much you want to talk about this new concept. Well, it's just an airplane. It uses pretty much existing technologies. I uh, didn't derive anything from any sources of any confusion or anything else. So. I, I don't see anything that can't be shown. It's just a notional something I'm playing with. If, if you think it's a problem, I'll stop right now, but I didn't problem. No, no, I just wanted to make sure you know, somebody doesn't go ahead and build on your ideas before you, you, know, you have a chance to publish it. Uh, I don't get in trouble for this. I, I uh, don't see this as anything that's a real problem. Uh, any, anybody uh, out there listening want to raise your hand and say, don't show it, Raymer? I mean, it's, it's a Mars airplane. It's, uh, it's just a Mars airplane. Let's have you go ahead, Dan. Sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah, maybe by the time I'm done, uh, there'll be a gray sedan outside with two guys I don't know knocking on my door. <laughs> so, 
I, I don't think so. And there's, it, it's very speculative and there's no, uh, no technology, uh, no technology shown. I, I, I'll press on, I'll press on. I don't think it's a problem. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, and, and oh, yeah. Okay. So what I decided to do basically is to design an airplane that I think we're going to need when we already are living on Mars. That, that's the idea. If we're living on Mars, we're going to need to get around. And I just thought, well, what we'd kind of like is something a whole lot like an early Jeep. So here's a great picture of a prototype Jeep. It looks like it's flying. The crazy guy just went over some kind of a ramp or something. Uh, but in any case, something about like that. So a couple of people, and I just kind of arbitrarily said 500 pounds, that's about the same weight of two people plus their, you know, what, what they're wearing and stuff. So I decided uh, two people are 500 pounds. Uh, I decided to at least shoot for the range of the prototype Jeep, which was 260 nautical miles. Uh, it looks like I've exceeded that, but that's based on a whole lot of assumptions. So who knows what the real number is. Uh, I assume there is a Mars permanent base, and I assume that base has lots of available electrical energy. So either we have uh, solar cells all over the place, uh, or we have a nice little nuclear power plant, which is probably the solution. Uh, I assume large pressurized buildings, we can assemble this thing. We, we don't, you know, it's, we're not living out of some little tiny land or something like that. And I assume that there's smart people there uh, and who, who are there to stay. And I assume that we're going to produce the big stuff locally, although you could, you could ship the whole thing, build it on Earth and ship the whole thing there. But at least I'd like to lean in the direction of a design that could be built locally using larger 3D printers, uh, maybe cannibalize the arrival airframes for metals and electronics, or maybe just ship up uh, pallets of, of the stuff that you need. Uh, I think we definitely need to produce the propellants locally, which luckily Jim French has already shown me how to do. So I started thinking about this some more and looking at the design drivers, assumptions, and things like that. And of course, the number one driver is this thin atmosphere. It's 1.6% of a sea level standard day. So that's not much air. That drives everything you try to do. Luckily, the gravity is less. So the net effect is not quite as bad, but still design your airplane to take off here on Earth and make the wings 23 times bigger to fly on Mars. So that's pretty crazy. And, and a little side note, watch the prop tip speeds because in the carbon dioxide atmosphere, um, the speed of sound is a lot lower. So you gotta take that into account. You don't wanna have your propeller tips shut out at cruising speed. Uh, I want a pressurized cabin. I thought about that. We could force them to fly in a spacesuit, but nah, let's, let's go for it. So pressurized cabin, want a good field of view. Why, why go to Mars if you can't look out the window? Uh, probably need vertical takeoff. Uh, you're going to be flying off air bases because there aren't any air bases. And this issue of ground clearance is real. Kind of have good ground clearance. Uh, so some assumptions I made, and again, this is a, a quick study, so I had to assume a lot of things rather than doing an exhaustive set of trade studies. Uh, if somebody funded this, I would do an exhaustive set of trade studies and and uh, give you different answers. But I think this is a pretty pretty good starting point. So I'm going to use wing and battery electric for forward flight. Uh, I will assume solar cells, at least I put a weight penalty for some kind of integral solar cells where the skin is the solar cell, um, but probably it's not going to be enough energy for perpetual flight, probably, so uh, I'm not even going to take credit for the solar cells. I'm going to fly entirely on battery power, at least for this design study. But once you land, uh, you can recharge with solar cells. Uh, I will use the, the carbon monoxide uh, oxygen rockets, as Jim French defined. Uh, Jim wants to do onboard propellant extraction. I decided not to not to go that far. So I'm I'm uh, designing and sizing the vehicle for out and back missions. So you have a main base you fly from, you fly out, you land, and you fly back to the main base and, and take on more propellant. And I'm assuming a 2030 time frame. I just sort of made up a magic number 10 years out. Uh, and that's far enough out that we don't know what the technologies will be. And really my calculations are more trying to find out how good I have to assume to make it workable than to actually calculate which technologies make it happen. So that's also why I don't think this is any problem for overseas people. I'm not telling you what technologies are and how good they are. I'm saying, hey, if you want this to work, you have to somehow make this happen. Okay, well, uh, here's, here's what I came up with and I'll show you how this evolved and what it looks like. But uh, there's the vehicle flying, it's approaching. 
Uh, it's getting closer, it's coming in, it's ready to land, it fires its landing jets and it touches down, uh, and then it, it flies away. And, and they're actually landing rockets, of course. So that's the basic design that I've come up with. I, I think it holds together. I'm pretty proud of this, actually. Kind of a funny looking thing, but it, it grows on you. Uh, so uh, basic operational concept, uh, what I assumed, uh, optionally manned. So you don't have to have people flying it. You can fill it full of stuff and it'll fly from point A to point B. Uh, if there are people at point B, like explorers out there uh, doing something, then you can deliver supplies to them. Uh, that's kind of the basic idea. Or you can have a couple of people in there and a little bit of bags uh, totaling uh, 500 pounds. Uh, so it is a pressurized vehicle. What happens if the pressure vessel cracks? Well, you can either have the weight of a spacesuit for them or they die. Uh, take your bag. Uh, I, I kind of lean for the spacesuit, but uh, that can be decided later. Uh, it won't be piloted in a traditional sense. You don't have to have stick and rudder qualified pilots. Uh, uh, basically, you'll have a flight director sort of a thing, more like flying a video game. You jump in and you sort of tell it to take me there. You can have a little joystick to turn left, right, up, down if you want, but you're not really flying. You're not doing stick and rudder stuff. You're directing the autopilot, and it can fly completely unmanned. Uh, for landing, you sort of designate where you want to land, and I'm not sure how, probably some kind of a heads-up optical sort of a thing. You'll, you'll put a cross there and land me there. Uh, I think that's better than trusting the pilots. Okay, um, let's see, what else? Uh, designing it to have two takeoff and landing cycles, so once taken away and, and another time coming back. Uh, and uh, I build it mostly out of uh, 3D printings, my assumption. Uh, a question comes up, well, you know, what about those winds on Mars? I, I saw a movie, Jason Bourne almost died. Well, um, 60 mile an hour is about the maximum wind, and at that air pressure, it's a tenth of a pound per square foot. So that's the equivalent of a four mile per hour light breeze here. So a bad windstorm on Mars that blows all the dust around will hardly affect this thing at all. I think we will have to tie it down uh, we'll probably have to put uh, you know, some kind of little, little tie downs out at the root, uh, at the wingtips, and some kind of little thing you screw into the ground. That'll take. Okay, here's the configuration design that I came up with. Uh, and like I said, I was trying to give good ground clearance, helicopter like skids, because we're landing vertically. Um, so you've got the wing up on those pylons, and you've got little nacelles out there, and in the nacelles are eight of GEMS uh, carbon monoxide oxygen rockets. Uh, and they're uh, centered around the center of gravity so that if you lose any one of them, you can shut down the matching one on the opposite side. Uh, and, and, on, it was more than that. Uh, and you'd have redundancy. I'm showing completely separate propell propellant lines and you'd have some crossover or, or you may put some more tanks. Those are the size of the tanks required for uh, two cycles. Uh, also, uh, outboard a little bit, uh, outboard a little bit, you can see the battery boxes, and uh, these are for the inner uh, engines. I've got uh, two motors inboard and two outboard. Uh, the outboard ones are tractors, the inboard ones are pushers, and that's to help put the CG in the right place. Uh, and uh, there's more batteries outboard, so each, each uh, um, motor has its own battery pack. Let's see, what else can you see here? Uh, there is a vertical tail. Uh, I'm planning on not having it actually give you slightly positive stability uh, in case you do momentarily lose your engine power for some probably computer glitch reason. So at least you don't flip out of control instantly. Um, possibly we can throw those away. I, I actually didn't have them in the earliest version of that. We may decide to trust our electrical system uh, and just not even worry about it. Okay, let's see. Uh, here's a little bit more showing design features. Here are the eight lift rockets in these nacelles, and in the back of the nacelle are uh, a couple of electric motors. Uh, they're deliberately designed with very large diameter on the electric motor. I'm not a motor expert, but I'm hoping with a, an outrunner type arrangement we can get a good torque, not need any sort of gearbox, maybe. Uh, the front is a clear hemisphere. Uh, my weight estimation was based on plexiglass, although I'm sure we can use something smarter than that. Um, and that would be the door, and it would swing probably to one side and a little bit up, although we can look at different ways of swinging it. Uh, and basically, it would, it would seal here around the perimeter, uh, much the way that you seal 
uh, a, uh, an autoclave. If you've ever seen how that works, it's sort of a, a rotating thing that it walks in. Uh, so it, a little bit awkward to climb in, but basically to get in, you basically sit down on the lip here and then scoot yourself up. And remember, you only weigh a third as much as normal, so pretty easy to do it. Uh, or you can put stuff in here. There is a pressure bulkhead at this ring. I realize I forgot to show it in this. I uh, called up the uh, components for, for this view. But there is a pressure bulkhead back here, an ice, uh, isotensoid pressure bulkhead back here. Uh, this very back part of the fuselage is just a thin shell, basically, to try to get a little bit of improved aerodynamics. Uh, OK, let's see. Uh, what else we got? Uh, right. And as I said, I would look at using solar cells as the upper skin. If that isn't a huge weight penalty, we could do that. I threw in 200 pounds of weight for solar cells replacing the skin. So these aren't, these aren't uh, glue on solar cells like we mostly use today. This is integral stuff. People are making this, I assume, in 10 years or more. Uh, this should be a real good technology. One more thing I may need over on the right here, I may need to add rockets in the back of the fuselage. That's one of the reasons it looks like this. Uh, and the reason for that is, is simple. It may take too long to accelerate with just the propellers. And at a low speed, there's not a lot of air uh, to accelerate you. Uh, and if it takes too long to accelerate with the propellers, you're, you're burning rocket fuel during that whole time hovering. So it may be better to use some rocket thrust to get you up to cruising speed where the propellers can start to take a bite into the air. I'm not sure. I didn't show them on the baseline. Uh, they didn't weigh very much, but you do have to add propellant for that. Okay, so that's my basic design. This shows the wing plan form that I came up with. Uh, I actually designed it as a separate inner and outer panel, so I had to have my computer program figure out the equivalent reference, and it's about a aspect ratio of about 57, so that's not real easy to build structurally. Uh, it looks pretty wild, but it's not impossible. Wing area of, of about 2,000 square feet uh, necessary, and the calculations have come up. Uh, I did do a lift to drag ratio calculation at, at low altitudes at, at Earth sea level, you get lift to drag ratios getting up close to 100, but you don't get that up at the, uh, uh, the high altitude that's the equivalent of Mars. 105,000 feet on Earth is a rough approximation for flight on Mars, but you do get about 42 lift to drag ratio um, at the lift coefficient we'll be flying at. So not bad, you know, not great, but not bad. I did weight build up, and uh, this is a largely uh, a bunch of guesses. It sort of has to be uh, but I actually put together in a spreadsheet uh, pounds per square foot approximations and then try to, to correlate those to things that have already been done, uh, adjust them based on the reduced uh, gravity, the, the weight of things is less, the mass is the same, but the weight is less. Uh, and I made up some numbers and, and uh, you know, that's what you do on a wild project like this. And clearly this is something that, that needs some real effort by people that know what they're doing, but my record's pretty good. I don't think I'm too far off. Uh, and I wound up coming up with a, uh, a, 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 an empty weight fraction of about 0.7. So it's nothing magical. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of uh, mass there for structural weight. Uh, and structure alone is about 0.43. And again, that's, that's a pretty reasonable allowance. It's, it's not magical. It's good, but I don't think it's magical. Okay, uh, when I started this thing, I was looking at doing a deep stall landing approach. Uh, which is something that has been uh, flight tested with manned airplanes, and we do a lot with uh, radio control model airplanes. Uh, we have something where we can flip the uh, horizontal tail uh, almost vertically, and it makes the vehicle stall, and it drops pretty much straight down right into your hands if you do it right. So that seemed like a good approach. Uh, so I was looking at that, and then I thought, well, okay, um, you know, how much rocket propellant do I need to, uh, to catch it? Uh, just before it hits the ground, you blast the rockets and stop the descent. So I did some quick calculations there, assuming a projected uh, area based on the plan form and a projected drag coefficient of one, which is fairly conservative. And I get a real high sink rate, 145 knots straight down. <laughs> Not so good. And I fire up my rockets. I couldn't do it with, with the 300-pound uh, thrust of the baseline, so I doubled the rockets. Uh, and it still took me 18 seconds uh, and 2,000 feet to stop. So that's not going to work. At least I don't think so. So I switched it then to just a regular vertical takeoff, vertical landing. So you fly horizontal, you slow down basically to wing stall speed, and then you slow down some more and you start bringing up the rocket thrust uh, while you hold the wing at the angle for CL max. 
uh, and uh, finally you slow down enough. And, uh, so that looks a little more feasible. All right, wing size. This was exciting. Uh, put together a little spreadsheet and tried to figure out uh, what flight speed I would need to give me a wing area that seemed like it was not insane. Uh, and it turns out, as you would expect, that a high stall speed makes things a whole lot better. So you definitely need those rockets for takeoff and landing. And I finally settle on 115 knots stall speed, which is, which is pretty fast, but uh, if you have a cruising speed of about 150 knots, 115 knot stall speed gives you a real nice margin and it seems reasonable. Uh, so that gave, uh, gave me a wing area uh, of just under 2,000 square feet shown here, uh, adjusted for the reduced weight on Mars. So that's what I used as a design to actually wound up designing with a slightly larger wing than that. So that all seems pretty good. The one big assumption here is the wing maximum lift coefficient. Uh, and I used 1.6. Uh, it, it seems kind of sort of reasonable, but we're at a pretty low Reynolds number. So we have to do some very clever airfoil design. So this is something that needs technology. And uh, I'll assume somebody smarter than me can write a wonderful inverse computer code and give me a wing with that lift coefficient. Otherwise, I have to make the wing bigger. And it's a direct proportionality. All right, another spreadsheet to uh, do uh, range and uh, climb calculations. So I made a bunch of guesses on future technologies. And again, this is, this is not what I think will be possible. This is what we have to do. So we typically get a battery energy density these days of around 260. That's, that's a good battery, not, not the one you use for your model airplane. That's a good battery. Uh, there is some research with much better batteries getting up around 650. That's really pushing the state of the art and I'm not sure how practical they are. So I just picked a nice round number. So I assume by that time period, we ought to get around 500. And so all the range values I show are based on 500. It's a direct proportionality. If we don't get that, you can just do the ratio and find out how much range we get. Made some assumptions as to efficiencies. I assumed an 80% uh, propeller efficiency. That's a nice number on Earth. Are we gonna get that on Mars? Are my propellers big enough? How many blades do we need? Uh, do they have to have you know, a variable pitch and stuff like that? I don't know. Use some help if other people want to jump in on this. Uh, that's the kind of question I'd love to get an answer to. Uh, that's the lift to drag ratio I calculated. I think it's pretty credible. And I'm getting uh, about a thousand nautical miles range. So that's quite a bit more than needed. But I will say it's very sensitive how much range you get. If the weight goes up a little bit, the available battery weight, the battery mass fraction goes down uh, proportionally uh, and you get less range. So if the wing is substantially heavier than I think it is, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> So we have to reach that wing weight. Okay, but if the numbers add up, yeah, pretty good range. That's actually very useful. That would be a nice thing to have on Mars. Uh, climb vertical velocity, I needed to know how much uh, power I needed in the engines and also how much battery juice I'd use up during a climb. Uh, and uh, it, it turns out uh, to get what I consider a reasonable rate of climb, about 300 meters in a minute. I mean, it's not real fast, but you could sort of imagine staggering up to a you know, 300 meter cruising altitude, that's probably where I'd cruise at. So uh, to do that, I have, I need quite a bit more powerful uh, uh, electric motors. And it's actually 3.72 times as powerful as I need for level flight. So that's okay, that's what I size them to. Okay, well, what do you know? Based on my assumptions, this thing actually looks like it works. You know, we have to, we have to get all those uh, technologies, and I, I don't know what technologies get us there, I'm just saying the technology has to give us numbers like this. But if we can get numbers like this, then a design like mine looks like it would work. So uh, let me refresh your memory. What, uh, what assumptions did I make uh, to make this work? Uh, well, I had to assume pretty lightweight structure, and the bulk of the structure is the wing, that giant 350 foot long wing, uh, has to be quite light in weight. It was, I think, about 1,800 pounds, so I'm not assuming, you know, crazy magic, but still, that's a pretty big wing for, for a little over 1,000 pounds. It works out to just under one pound per square foot, uh, which is, you know, it's not impossible. Uh, general aviation airplane is about two and a half pounds. Uh, it has lower aspect ratio, but it's carrying the weight on Earth, so the weight being carried by the wing is a third less, and Let's assume some magic technologies and some good structural designers. Uh, if they can make this happen, 0.95 pounds per square foot, the rest of them can probably happen. 
Uh, okay, uh, battery technology, like I said, uh, we need something like 500 watt hour per kilogram, uh, almost double what we normally get today. It has to be something that isn't so, uh, so spooky strange to operate that you wouldn't put it in a vehicle like this. It has to be kind of like today's batteries, you stick it in there and it, and it works for years. Uh, so uh, that's, what we, that's what we need. Uh, I, I made pretty aggressive assumptions on all the, uh, the uh, weights in terms of life support and stuff like that. Much better than you had in something like the Apollo program, obviously. Uh, so we need to have a lot of clever, good design to keep those weights below the numbers that I used. Uh, and also realize that this is conceptual level analysis. It's the methods in my RDS aircraft design software, uh, properly adjusted for being on Mars. But it's not, you know, not high end computational fluid dynamics and we need to do that. And the final one is that I did mention this wing CL max is, is a nice number for Earth. Uh, difficult to get that at the low Reynolds numbers that we'll be at. Even at a 150 knots, it's still a pretty low Reynolds number. A little note at the bottom, the, uh, the rocket part is actually not the hard part. Uh, that's pretty well doable. We've done that. Uh, about the only really tricky part, I think, is the producing of the propellant on Mars might require some kind of a, uh, a facility that is, that is so big and, and heavy that we can't get it to Mars. Uh, I'm not the expert on that, and experts say it can be done. So, Okay, well, what next? Like it says, nobody really needs it today. Uh, but some people are planning on setting up on Mars sometime in the fairly near future. Maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 30 or 40 years, but uh, at least I think it's nice to start looking at a design like this, see if there's any possibility of having a vehicle like this. I uh, don't think the usual government funding sources would in be interested, but maybe some wild and crazy office at, uh, at NASA might uh, be interested in jumping in on this. So uh, by all means, if somebody wants to fund this, love to put a team together and, and spend some serious effort on it. Uh, I did this much for free, so if somebody else is interested in playing with it some, uh, come on in. <laughs> we can do it. It'd be fun. And there are some of the things that obviously need to be done. Uh, one thing I'd like to see done uh, is uh, an X-plane interface. I understand there's an X-plane on Mars. It'd be awfully fun to put this thing in there and, and see how this flies around Mars. I think that's it. Yep, that, that is it. So I'll... Uh, I'll leave it here, and uh, and I'm done and ready for questions. Uh, Dan, there are a lot of questions uh, printed out uh, online, and we have a no number of people online right now. We have close to 90 people at some stage five minutes ago, I saw. Okay. So I'm going to write, uh, read one by one questions, uh, and also I have my own questions too. Uh, the first question is, uh, when you talk about Mars, uh, there is no energy. We, sunlight is very weak. And also the gravity is different. So our weights are different. Uh, does this take into account your designs? How, how are you going to produce electricity there and things like that because of no sunlight? Well, two, two good questions there. The one about electricity. People keep talking about solar energy on Mars. Uh, and I don't quite get it for just that reason. It's a lot farther up. Uh, and uh, they also have this bus problem that, uh, that is, is a real one. Um, so I, I don't quite get that, but other people who are smarter than I am on that subject are researching it and looking at it. Uh, and, uh, and they use it on the, uh, the exploration vehicles that land on Mars. So there must be something to it. So I'll let them figure that out. Uh, the easy approach sort of my baseline is just assume a nuclear power plant and we're getting better and better at small nuclear power plants. I, I think before we can do a nuclear power plant that provides lots of electrical power, we can send it up, maybe it's one payload and it, and it lands and there it is and, and you, you plug all your stuff into it. So that's, that's the assumption I would make. As far as the reduced gravity on Mars, yes, I, I took that into account. It's in all my calculations. And, and I got to say, it's confusing as heck also, uh, because you keep have to checking. Some of the equations are really mass. And if you have an equation where you input weight, but it's actually using it for mass, then you do the conversion with the Earth basis 32.2 conversion. For other calculations, though, you need the weight force on Mars. So all, all I'll say is for students out there, be careful. <laughs> Watch out. I assume I did it correctly the first time every time. but. That's not a good assumption. So I think back a couple of times and make sure I, I did it correctly. 
Of course. Hey, Jim Frisch here. I have a comment. Oh, hey, Jim. Hi, how are you? Good, Great. good job. Thanks for helping. Uh, I would just, first I'd like to say that to say there is no solar energy available on Mars is not true. There is substantial, not as much as there is on Earth. But you know what it what it does not allow you to do is operate at high power levels directly off of solar. The original Mars airplane concept that I brought came up with, and then I brought Dan in to make some some realism in the airplane design. Was yes, it used solar power, so solar rays on the wings, which is a lot more feasible now than it was 20 or 30 years ago, and. The idea was an unmanned vehicle, roughly the flying equivalent of the rovers that we have today, that would fly someplace, land, start doing scientific investigations, and since it was sitting there anyway, it would generate propellant out of the Mars, Martian atmosphere, doesn't require water, doesn't require anything but the atmosphere, and tank up so that after some days or some weeks, depending on how it works, you take off and fly somewhere else. So that in the period of, if this were the Curiosity sure. rover with the, but, but could fly, by now we would have probably covered most of the planet rather than grunging along at a, a few inches per second for, for a few days at a time. That was the idea, to give us a broader uh, <coughs> view of the planet Mars, just the same way the rovers do except covering hundreds to thousands of miles rather than hundreds of thousands of feet. Um, I would say one other thing going back to your launch vehicle, the other virtue of powered vertical landing is if you have to ditch, if you're too far away to fly back, you have a problem and you need to ditch. I'd hold, we have ample de de demonstrations that using engine power, you can land intact in the ocean to be picked up. Whereas if you have an aerodynamic vehicle that touches down at 250 miles an hour a la the shuttle, there ain't no way you're going to ditch that in the ocean and survive. <laughs> so in the long run, I think the powered vertical descent for these vehicles is probably the safer way to go. And those were my two comments, so I'll, I'll now shut up. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with the powered vertical thing. Um, as far as the solar cells, I wound up using them on this design. Uh, as you described. Uh, I'm not taking credit for flying because there isn't enough energy, but when you're sitting on the ground, they can trickle charge. So if, if they can come up with uh, solar cells that'll cover most of this wing and the whole, the whole thing doesn't add more than 200 pounds to the weight of the wing, then, then it's in here. That's, that's kind of my target number. But that was my target number. So, thank you so much for your help. You know, Jim, the one thing I forgot to ask you is, is what the weight would be of the processing facility. Can I stick it in this thing? I've got a nice space for it right behind the, uh, the passenger pod. I, I can stick it right here if it doesn't weigh too much. So if you want to want to give me that offline, I can uh, see if it possibly fits within the weight budget. I, I got to tell you at this point, I'd have to go way back into the archives. I don't remember the numbers. It's not a particularly heavy system unless you're looking for real, really high flow rates. But um, probably the worst part is not so much the generation of the CO and the O2 as it is the li liquefaction of those two. That's going to yeah. take some power. So I really couldn't give you a good number, Dan. It would take some more study of, of the system design, which we never really got to in the, in the original concept or subsequently. Yeah. So kind of a, a I'm sure it's doable. It's a matter of how long you're willing to wait more than anything else. Yeah. You sort of need a suitcase locks generator, and I, I don't think that exists yet. Ken, Ken next question. Uh, Dan, uh, another question is about the thin atmosphere in Mars, the drag being different than in the air here. How does that impact? Well, as an approximation, given the time I had and, and the complete lack of funding, I, I made the assumption that a lot of people which is that we'll assume that it's the same air that you get on Earth at around 103, 105,000 feet. It's not exactly true. The chemistry is actually different. You know, it's made of different stuff. Uh, but somebody has to run some high-end Navier-Stokes solvers with the atmosphere changed uh, before we'll really know those answers. I'm sure other people have done that. I just haven't. Uh, there is a comment by Bruce McKenzie. 
radiant rocket is like a popsicle rocket with lasers and eyes by the guy associated with Dartmouth College. I will remember his name. Now, there have been other concepts that look a whole lot like that, where they take the solar energy and concentrate it into a laser, and the laser then aims it up to the vehicle. Uh, and, and that might be the best way, I don't know, but my idea basically cuts out the middleman, just bounce the sun's energy directly to the launch vehicle. There is a comment by Mr. Greg Lynch. Neat Mars airplane design, but seems like a helicopter will be the first thing to fly in Mars atmosphere, which is like flying at 100,000 MSL. Did you think of an alternate to the clusters with a hybrid option where you could use something like a single very large diameter twisting spar ultra high inertial rotor with slowed rotor compound characteristics or two smaller of those one on each wing? maybe on pylon above your tractor props that will spin up electrically or with propeller and propellant and provide for the space auto rotative landings in case of total system failure once ready with to seems like there is off nominal thruster failures that are going to end in bad day and would help with your transitions from to to cruiser or descent and approach to landing uh, there were a, a couple of questions and a comment in there. If I, if I remember what you just said, it was kind of a long question. Uh, the short answer to the first part of the question is no. <laughs> I, I didn't look at a helicopter. That would be a very interesting alternate design study. It's just a completely different kind of thing. I did not look at a helicopter. I, I, I didn't look at a hundred other possibilities. This is not a detailed train study as I would normally do. This is a hip shot. This is one vehicle that kind of looks like it works. No. No guarantee this is the best vehicle or anything else. It's just one vehicle that looks like it would work. Uh, as far as landing on the thrusters, uh, I've got it set up so if you lose any one of those thrusters, you can immediately shut down its opposite number and then you're still in balance and I have enough excess thrust and propellant to land on and stuff. If you lose two of them, you're really out of luck. More questions? Uh, Yes, go ahead. I have some more questions by readers, listeners have written. Uh, Dan, uh, Santosh Kumar here. Excellent presentation, by the way. The um, uh, question I have for you is, uh, what about coming back? Any thoughts? I mean, you didn't really put any slides on that, but any considerations if we need to come back from Mars and don't want to just be there permanently? Well, um, I probably uh, you should ask Jim French because I think his... Uh, his carbon monoxide locks rockets are probably the way you'd want to do it. Uh, you can just slowly build a large supply of that stuff and get back up uh, into uh, a vehicle that's probably still orbiting. I mean, that's a whole different design challenge, but that, that's probably the best approach. Nothing that, that would really address that. That's more straightforward uh, launch vehicle design. Um, the next question is from Giovanni about the Mars plane. Any thoughts on how this device could be maintained? How it would be maintained? Well, um, probably a lot of the maintenance would be pretty large scale uh, replacement rather than maintenance. But as I said, I'm assuming that this is far enough in the future that there is a fixed establishment on Mars with with multiple people, I, I don't know how many that is, five, 10, 20, and they have large buildings, probably inflatable would be my guess, but maybe not. Uh, Bob Zubrin just proposed we drill out underneath a, uh, an ice uh, crater and uh, if you do it properly, you could actually live underneath it, which sound, sounds scary, but, but uh, the right way. Uh, in any case, uh, so I'm assuming that you, you do maintenance inside these large facilities probably pull the wing off. I've deliberately designed it so the wing comes off easily. Uh, it's sitting above those nacelles. It's not over the nacelles. So you'd probably pull the wings off and lift it off with some kind of a little cherry picker. You'd have to take with you or build on Mars uh, and uh, then slide the vehicle in and work on it inside. Uh, Mr. Greg Lynch has more technical questions. Can can you unmute Mr. Greg Lynch because uh, he has some more technical questions. So it's better that he uh, asks them and you know have the answers right away. Okay, then can you unmute. Okay. Great. Mr. Greg okay. Lynch. Okay, he's unmuted. 
can you can you ask the questions that you are typing it just easier please unmute it a uh, great can you hear okay i'll read his question until he comes online the greg's question is my background bridges fixed and wing rotary wing experiences with conceptual designs for uam and vertical takeoff and landing and thin hall markets and six years at skunk works on a fixed wing program using a hybrid design your wing design could then be optimized for cruise max length to diameter and it wouldn't be like the moments before apollo the eagles has landed tension with bat and propellant exhaustion before touchdown so I, I'm, I'm unmuted now but that's yeah, basically the follow-up to the first question not that we're looking at a helicopter design but a variation on the theme for his wing designs uh, when you looked at those you know the very large wing and trying to get to low transition speeds or you're basically stall speed for that wing uh, so a wing design where it was designed for max l over d at cruise uh, for best efficient cruise and then basically these slow rotor compound rotors that you know slowly spin up on the ground while you're still connected to ground power uh, so you, you're basically not wasting electrical battery energy or uh, propel on board when you're at your main station but that that was kind of the idea so it's just you know and you explained it in your first answer which is you know it was just a single shot look and you hadn't done other trades but that was my question that, that sounds like a fun approach to look at too uh, there's, there's a lot of approaches and I'd love to look at all of them. Dan, Greg is giving ideas to write a new book. <laughs> maybe you want to make him a co-author or maybe acknowledge him. <laughs> uh. Okay, another question to uh, Mr. Greg Lynch. Can you send me your email address? Uh, uh, sure. Now, another question is uh, by anonymous attendee. Dan, what is your go-to CAD software package? As a designer, what differences do you see when designing something for free versus in project, in a project? Well, I, I use my own software. Uh, some of you know that I wrote and market the RDS Win aircraft design software, and it, it also does spacecraft design and has its own CAD module, which you're looking at. I wrote that too. Uh, so, Mr. Anonymous Arendi, I'm going to send you uh, Dan's uh, email address, so you could probably uh, email it to him about the software that he has designed, so you could probably get a copy of it, whichever way he wants to. So, you can email it to Ken or me, and we'll provide you his email address. The other part of the question was, what is different for something that I'm paid for? And the answer is nothing. I, I use this because it's the, the fastest tool I know of for putting a vehicle together. And, on professional projects like the DARPA project that I was supposed to be working on last week instead of doing this. I use this also and uh, when I get to the point where I have a configuration then I export an IGES file and send it out and we run CFD and do structural design, FEA and all that kind of stuff. Any more questions? I hear more questions. There's a list of questions. In the Radiant rocket system in the radiant rocket propulsion uh, rockets power system what temperature could be the heat target rich by papula bharat simha and what was the very last part of the question in the radiant rocket power system what temperatures could the heat target rich oh i do not remember uh, i'm sorry i was not the guy who did those calculations um and there's a very old graph that they calculated Sorry, I don't have that calculation. Some, somebody else could probably recreate it pretty quickly, uh, but I don't okay. remember and I didn't do that myself. Mr. Uh, Mo Almurella, raise the hand. I think we need to unmute him so he can ask question. Okay, let me, uh, let me unmute him. Let me see, where is? Mo Almurella. Uh, Sorry. Okay, he he's, should be able to talk. Mr. Mo? Until Mr. Mo comes online, we'll go for the second question. Uh, what was the power requirement of the motor by James Sloan? I think I have that here, hang on a second. Problem with using spreadsheets for everything is that, that uh, you write the spreadsheet and then when you're all done, you, you don't memorize the answers because you didn't have to calculate it by hand. Let's see it. Uh, there's the power to weight ratio, which was required. And um, 
it's horsepower to uh, to weight on the right side and multiply that times, and I'm trying to think, is it by the 6,000 or is it 6,000 adjusted for the Mars weight? Uh, I think in that case it is the 6,000. So that would give you the answer. Oh, and then multiply it by the 3.72 down here. So I don't know on my head what that number is. It's buried in the equation, but multiply this times 6,000 times this, and that would be the power. I've got it on a, another spreadsheet, which I didn't include in my view graphs. Okay, Mo has typed the question. My question is whether the vehicle is designed to sit on a flat surface. If it doesn't have to sit on a flat surface, would that change the energy consumption while taking off? I'm thinking that because I wonder if the surface in Mars was taken into consideration in your design. Well, I gave it pretty generous helicopter-like landing skids because they're pretty forgiving. Uh, uh, there would also be some kind of a skid out uh, either at a wing tip or more likely under the outboard nacelles, which uh, would be out here. I think there's probably just little fingers reaching down that, that would uh, stop it from rocking any further. Um, as, uh, and we, we all see the photographs of Mars and it looks like there's a bunch of rocks around there. So uh, something like a skid like this should be, I, I, it was as good as I could think of uh, it works well for helicopters, so that's why I did it. Uh, we could probably do some calculations to see what the likely rock size would be, and uh, maybe you need to make it higher off the ground for that. Uh, but uh, that's what I did. Uh, yeah, there is a question. Can still, pretty easily get in, which was another consideration. You have to, you know, the people and whatever, the, you know, whatever payload you have, you have to get in. So it's kind of a compromise. Uh, there is a question or a comment by Navya, Navya, Navya Narayanan. I am Navya, graduate student from USC, and I am really interested to work on CFD and airfoil design. She's probably making a comment. Well, e email me. Uh, okay, so those who want to, uh, I need the email addresses of all of these people who are asking questions. If you have any questions, I'll forward them to uh, Dan. And James, also I need your email address too. There is a question by Suresh Sonvain from India. He's attending from India. Assuming this prototype is designed as per Mars environment conditions like atmospheric pressure, wind gravity, how to test such system on Earth? Are there any simulation technologies available to test? Well, you would test it by flying it at a lower altitude um, to uh, basically adjust for the, the difference in, uh, in weight. You, you fly it at an altitude where you got more lift adjusting for the difference in weight. Structurally, you really couldn't do it. Uh, you'd have to make it much stronger to operate on Earth as a test vehicle. But you could do that. Uh, you, know, you, could, you could adjust it. You could make a subscale version, big model airplane, at least see if you can get the dynamics to work. Uh, I didn't mention controls, by the way. I'm assuming I'll be using differential thrust as a yaw control, uh, and uh, that might be all the roll control I need. If you put regular ailerons out there, it might have a hard time. Uh, I'm also very interested in some of the modern technologies uh, for control, these uh, little micro actuators that you can put on the top of the wing or at the trailing edge. Uh, and I prefer to use something like that than great big giant elevons out there. Uh, but that's, that's a place that needs to be done. Uh, question from R.P. Ovisp. Hi, Dr. Raymer. This is such a wonderful presentation. Does your Raymer Mars plane have any winglets? Winglets? No. The no. same person, R.P., asked another question. For obtaining CL max is equal to 1.6 at low RE, did he also consider using rotating cylinders using the Magnus effect? Uh, no, no, that, that's, and it, that, that concept has a lot of problems, especially for a wing as long and, and likely flexible. Uh, so no, I, I didn't look at that. Uh, so Hi. all the questions, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Hey, if you, if you want to know why it doesn't have winglets, come take my short course. We talk all about that. Yeah. Hi, this is Mo again. Um, so my question is, um, whether this vehicle is designed to land on Mars on a flat surface or uh, that doesn't matter design and whether it's 
designed for the uh, on a, to land on a flat or sit on a flat surface, would that also affect the energy consumption, whether it's uh, when it's um, taken off or uh, you know, since it's a vertical uh, take take off? Well, I, I assumed a a fairly flat but unprepared surface. So it's not something that's been prepared with bulldozers, uh, but you'd have to look for sort of a clearing that doesn't have any really big boulders in it, uh, kind of the same that they had to do when they landed on the moon. Uh, so it's, it's designed for, you know, well, that's why it has the uh, skids like helicopter, so it can land on a somewhat rough surface. Yeah, uh, and the second part of the question, is it gonna affect uh, energy consumption? I don't think that would affect it. Uh, by the way, that's one of the uh, one of the reasons that I went with that high wing, high nacelle approach. I, I wanted to get the rockets as far above the ground as I could uh, to minimize how much stuff they get off. Uh, I don't want them blinding the uh, the flight crew uh, covering the vehicle with junk. Uh, and they're also angled outward by ten degrees, uh, so that you don't. Uh, you know, whatever junk is kicked up when you land is away from the vehicle. Okay. Well, thank you very uh, much. Like uh, Dan, we have several people who want to actually either contact you or work with you. So I think I'm going to ask Ken to copy all these questions and answers and email it to me so we can forward them to uh, Dan. Uh, okay, another well, question. Well, yeah. Hang on a second. Let, let me say this. Uh, if you want to contact me, go to my website, aircraftdesign.com. And at the bottom, you can click there and send me a message. Okay, perfect. Your, your contact info and I'll read Lauren. Uh, another question is by Pedro. How flexible do you think this 757 aspect ratio wing could be? Are you concerned with the flight mechanics and aero, aero elastic coupling with this high level of flexibility? Well, I did put flutter on my list of things I need help on. I, I basically ignored it, not that I think it won't happen, but I assume that uh, you know there's going to be some flexibility. The wing will will bend, of course. Uh, I tried to put some mass out along the wing to help that a little bit. Uh, but um, yeah, it's going to be flexible. It's pretty hard to make something that long completely rigid. Sean Moran asked questions. So wouldn't ground resonance tear the aircraft apart from helicopter skids, especially if on a lo on a slope? I'll land on a slope. <laughs> That'd be bad. Yeah, you want to you want to make sure it's flat enough that you're not tipped sideways in, in any direction. Fore and aft is just about as bad. A question from Jaspeet String to Dr. Raymer: What is your opinion on tiltable propulsion units, say propeller motor or rocket motors? This might obviate the need for additional rocket propulsion. I'm sorry, uh, something. Um, what kind of propulsion? It sounded like tilt term table or something. Uh, Ken, can you please not uh, answer the questions? Let's let the screen stay at that one place, please. What is your opinion on tiltable propulsion units? Say propeller motors or rocket motors. This might obviate the need for additional rocket propulsion for landing as described in the presentation. I'm, I'm hearing everything, but I'm not understanding one word. Uh, uh, so what James, kind of propulsion? What, what is that word? I, I can't understand. Til it. Tiltable propulsion units. Tilt? Tilt, yeah. Tilt table? Yeah, tilt table, yes. Tilt table I, propulsion units. I, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, James uh, commented that most likely the rocket engines would be gimbaled for control in any case. This would be tilted for and aft to accelerate during ascent and to slow during landing. Oh, oh is, is the word tiltable like vectored? Is that what you're Yeah, tiltable. Oh, yeah, vector, okay. yeah. Vector, I, I did sorry. not. I did not put them there, but you certainly could. And Jim French's design allows for that possibility. Uh, I assume that we would control it by varying thrust uh, to the different rockets. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, adding a, a, a vectored capability would add more weight and complexity and more things to break, which I don't like, but it would also probably make it easier to control. Uh, it's one of those things, we'll do it if we have to. We need a lot more detailed study to see if it's necessary. Uh, but it's certainly possible. I did allow room when I did the layout. So there is enough room to put in some uh, vectoring ability on the rocket engines. 
Uh, Ken, do you want to unmute Mr. Bruce because he might have some additional questions or comments? Yeah, but but I think we kind of uh, it's a lot of questions already. Maybe we, uh, yeah, yeah, in private. Uh, so I, I yeah. think you guys can email uh, Ken or me or go to uh, Dan's website. website yeah. and we'll we'll be happy to answer your questions because we have we have run out of time now. Uh, Dan has a lot of experience in different areas and he's right, written several books. So as you know, he's you know distinguished speaker. But we also have limited time, and I'm sure he's probably tired. So there is a questions I have, but I think Kiran will probably have to take your questions offline and email it to Dan. Uh, so this Dan? is Jim Jim French here. Um, you, I think you at AIAA have my email address. If you wanted to put that up, so people could send me questions directly on the on the propulsion business, uh, please do so. Yeah, James, we'll, we'll get in touch with you as soon as the conference is over. Uh, Dan, okay. we really appreciate your help. Thank you so much. A lot of people have questions. I'm sorry, we, you, you, you probably are tired and there is time for, you know, limited oh, time. Time for other people to talk. You've got a lot of other people with things to say, so. So we're going to email you the questions. Great, okay. And and we probably will probably, since the talk is so popular, we probably have to have another talk with Dan next month, if he allows, if he has time. <laughs>